So we're happy to have um, Ella Mingasova here today for her lecture. Um, it's a lecture on Insta poetry when poetry goes viral. And Ella Mingasova is currently completing her doctoral thesis in English and American studies at the University of Liège and the University of Leuven, both in Belgium. The effect of slowness in reading narratives in brief and long forms constitutes probably the main focus of her research. She has, among other topics, analyzed the concept of slowness in Proust's prose. She has written on tweets by Tejo Cole, namely on small feet. The notion of slowness in Don DeLillo's Point Omega, slow travel writing by Canadian author Annex C, or the one sentence novel Sohn by Matthias Enard. To name but some of her research topics, usually centered around the questions of duration and ephemerality in the current cultural context of acceleration. Ella Mingasova's lecture today will be on poetry going viral, more precisely on Insta poetry, the popular new subgenre of poetry published on Instagram and other social media. Insta poetry, I quote Ella Mingasova, is characterized by a very straightforward style, close to ordinary language, and generally written in free verse. And it looks strikingly simple and sometimes naive. This, of course, proves to be a two-edged sword. The accessibility of most Insta poetry boosts its popularity. Simple poems are readable. Or as comedian and television host Jimmy Fallon phrased it when, intervie when interviewing Insta poetry star Rupi Kaur, Poetry is the new pop man. Hence, millions of predominantly young people are enjoying the verse of Insta poets like Rupi Kaur or Holly McNeish. Yet, Insta poetry's gross visibility contradicts the traditional idea of a poem as an ambiguous, sometimes dramatic, and formal text. This cult of the noble amateur, I quote Rebecca Watts, who has attacked Kaur and McNeish in PN Review has led to a heated debate about the artistic value of Insta poetry. Ella Mengasova's presentation will discuss how this debate, more often than not centered around the question of superficial and deep attention around speed and slowness, mirrors the struggle of the printed book in the age of digital media, which closely intersects with the collapse of the distinction between serious and popular literature, or one might perhaps add, between intellectual and non-intellectual texts. And now, Ella Mingasova, please. Thank you. Thank you for this very um, in-depth presentation, uh, introduction of my presentation. So as you just said, I uh, work on slowness. And um, in my work on that topic, which was first uh, focused solely on narratives, I got increasingly interested in poetry because of the very widespread idea that the reading of a poem uh, should take time, and that poetry is a demanding literary genre that requires slow reading. This idea is closely connected to a view of poetry as difficult and therefore as an elitist literary form that has a very limited audience. In recent years, this perception of the genre has been reshaped as poetry regained in popularity with the help of social media. Platforms such as Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube, and Twitter lying at the margins of the usual literary circuit, yet at the center of digital life, offer new ways of self-publishing, publishing, and consuming poetry. In this context, the term Insta-poetry, uh, a portmanteau of Instagram and poetry, has recently been coined to describe the popular new subgenre of poetry published on Instagram. The term, therefore, closely associates the content with the platform through which this uh, type of poetry is published. In the past years, several poets have reached very wide audiences on, on Instagram, which has attracted the attention of publishers. Tyler Not Poems, for instance, oh. yeah. um, first published on his Instagram account, which now has uh, 355,000 followers, were published by Tarchi Ferry G, an imprint of Penguin Random House. His first collection, uh, Chasers of the Light, uh, published in uh, 2014, was a national bestseller in the US, of which more than 120,000 copies were sold. 
R. M. Drake, another American poet with uh, 2.4 million followers on Instagram, has sold about 160,000 copies of his self-published poetry books, Black Butterfly and Beautiful Chaos, also in uh, 2014. So these fig figures sound impressive, especially for books of poetry, which typically print a few hundred uh, copies. But they are rather modest when compared to Rupi Kors, who is the most famous uh, example of a successful Insta poet, with 4 million followers on Instagram. Her collections of poetry, Milk and Honey and The Sun and the Flowers, uh, have sold 8 million copies and have, and have been translated into 42 languages. And I'm sure you, you have already seen these books in your local bookstores. And she has recently uh, published a new book called Homebody. Um, Milk and Honey was first self-published and later republished by Andrews McMill, uh, which publishes a number of well-known uh, Insta poets, among them Lang Lee, who is a New Zealander. In 2014, again, Lee's poem Closure was shared by Chloe Kardashian on her Instagram feed, which had uh, 14 uh, million followers at the time. So this is the poem. Closure, like time suspended, a wound and mended you and I. We had no ending, no said goodbye. For all my life, I'll wonder why. This post is often credited for making Insta poetry a trend, although Closure uh, was not published on Instagram by Lee. Chloe Kardashian took a photograph of a page from Neve's uh, first collection of poetry called Love and Misadventure. Although Neve is frequently uh, called an Insta poet, um, she did not publish her poetry on Instagram at all at the time, but on Tumblr, which is another app for sharing images and text. The term Insta poetry, in fact, um, uh, is used more broadly as an umbrella term for a certain kind of poetry published not only on Instagram, but also on Tumblr and Twitter, and increasingly also in book form by authors who already have an audience online. Insta poetry's uh, entry into the book market and Core's work in particular has been credited with a dramatic increase in sales of poetry books in Canada, the United States and the UK. In German-speaking countries, uh, even if nothing as spectacular has taken place, and correct me if I'm wrong, a few Insta poets have gained prominence as well, thereby contributing to a renewed interest in poetry. Such Insta poets include Julia Engelmann with uh, 340,000 uh, followers, and uh, Clara Luisa with uh, 220,000 followers. Both uh, Clara, uh, Clara Louisa and Julia Engelmann have published best-selling poetry books. In 2019, uh, Clara Louisa's printed collection of poetry, Von Verlassenen Träumen in einem Lichter und Morgen, sorry for my accent, <laughs> has sold more than 20,000 copies and landed a spot on the German Amazon uh, website's poetry bestseller list alongside the likes of Goethe and Rilke. Of course, uh, the German-speaking literary world and the English-speaking one have very different literary traditions. For instance, in relation to the divide between elitist and popular literature, which is not as strong anymore in the United States, but which is arguably still prevalent in Germany. And please um, tell me if I'm wrong in the discussion. I think it would be interesting to compare uh, how Insta poetry affects these two different uh, literary spheres, but this would need further investigation. This comparison would be a productive one, not least because German Insta poets are often influenced by contemporary poetry in English. Julia Engelmann, for instance, who is also known for her slam performances, has expressed her admiration for the well-known English slam artist, Kate Tempest. So in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to examine Insta poetry as a genre is a, a bit closer and talk about its reception, um, its formal features and its writers who um, 
a lot of whom are actually women. Social media and Instagram in particular uh, have played a crucial role in reshaping their perception of poetry as a genre in decline. Through Instagram, poetry has found a new public of young readers, as most of Instagram users are aged between 18 and 34. Because Insta poetry is generally written in free verse and is characterized by a very straightforward style close to ordinary language, as Matthias has already said in the introduction, it has frequently been praised for being accessible and hailed as a good way to initiate young people who do not usually read poetry to this genre. And I'm going to show you uh, a few of Rupi Kaur's poems from Milk and Honey. Our backs tell stories, no books have the spine to carry. Women of color, Rupi Kaur. The next time he points out the hair on your legs is growing back, remind that boy your body is not his home. He is a guest, warn him to never outstep his welcome again. There is a difference between someone telling you they love you and them actually loving you. As you can see, the literary quality of her poems is quite an impressive. The segmentation into verse, for instance, often seems arbitrary, which makes it actually difficult sometimes to read aloud. To be fair though, uh, her poetry works a bit better when collected into a book, rather than when it is presented as isolated bits on Instagram. In the book, the poems are arranged to create a progression and the juxtaposition of poems sometimes create interesting motifs. It is undeniable that Insta poetry often looks strikingly simple and sometimes naive. Of course, uh, not all poetry, Insta poetry is like this, as poetry posted on Instagram is far from being a monolithic genre. But I'm taking the example of Rupi Kaur's poetry here because um, it has influenced a lot of Insta poets and um, it has become representative of what the word Insta poetry means today for the general public. The oral style that characterizes chorus poems and much insta poetry has been praised by readers um, and interpreted as a sign of spontaneity and authenticity. As, re as remarked by Philippe Hert, uh, because most of our exchanges on the internet happen through the written word, we attribute to the imitation of orality in writing a sense of spontaneity and subjectivity. This unspoken orality or second orality is also associated with informal exchanges and a sense of immediacy. Think for instance of our manner of interacting when we write on platforms that seek, that seek to reproduce the social context of a face-to-face -face interaction, for instance, on an app uh, used for chatting such as WhatsApp or on forums. The oral style also permeates platforms that do not specifically seek to reproduce that social context, such as emails, and perhaps increasingly so in the current context of lockdown, where we no longer meet people uh, in real life. The sense of authenticity and spontaneity crops up repeatedly in blurbs and comments uh, of praise for Insta poetry. Consider the, this blurb for not Gregson's Chasers of the Light. One day, while browsing an antique store in Helena, Montana, photographer Tyler Knott Gregson stumbled upon a vintage Remington typewriter for sale. Standing up and using a page from a book on book, broken book, sorry, he was buying for $2. He typed a poem without thinking, without planning, and without the ability to revise anything. Another recurrent feature of Insta poetry related to orality is the constant use of cliches. Kaur argues that because she's reaching for the collective experience of the colonized female subject, there is little need for poetic originality. She tries, she says, to reach for a prim primitive or authentic language. Notice the uh, insistence on authenticity again. 
The use of cliches in Insta poetry undermines the importance of authorship and originality, while at the same time posing the problem of plagiarism. Insta poetry shares the feature of dissolved authorship together with oral style with Russian online poetic genres of Pirashki and Parashki. In his lectures given uh, on these genres for this research group, Maxim Anisamovich Krangaus argued that these are two of the reasons why Pirashki and Parashki can be qualified as folklore. Likewise, Insta poetry can be analyzed as part of the folklore of a specific community online. And I will say a little bit more about this community in a minute. In addition, Insta poetry shares with Pirashki and Parashki a frequent lack of capitalization and the use of swear words. Understandably, um, the accessibility of Insta poetry does not uh, inspire praise only. Despite its popularity, a lot of young and older readers uh, find course uh, poetry very unimpressive, and plenty of videos of young readers um, criticizing her poetry for being bad and hollow can be found on YouTube. Her poetry has also inspired a lot of parodies, such as this one. There is a difference between somebody, someone telling you they're ordering pizza and I'm actually ordering pizza. Rupi Kaur. Course poetry has also inspired a collection of uh, parodies called Milk and Vine. Vine is now a defunct app uh, that allowed people to share a very short six to seven seconds um, videos called Vines. Uh, and the videos are, are still available on YouTube. Um, the book was self-published by two young adults, age 18 and 19, in 2017. And uh, it immediately became a bestseller on Amazon. The authors of the book take quotes from uh, iconic vines and turn them into rupicoresque <laughs> poetry. Here are a few extracts from the book. Hi, my name is Trey. I have a basketball game tomorrow. It's an avocado. Thanks. These parodies are, of course, much funnier uh, when the vine they are extracted from is familiar. And this is a good example uh, of the existence of a web community with their own, or web communities with their own cultural references. Born on the internet, Insta poetry has managed to, um, to leave the online sphere and circulate traditional, through traditional literary channels. Tellingly, the teenage authors of Milk and Vine found Milk and Honey on a bookshelf at Barnes and Noble the biggest chain of bookstores in the US. And not only did Insta poetry enter these channels, which is in itself an exceptional, it also found a recognition in the literary community, in the traditional literary community, where it's part controversy. Some have expressed the opinion that this, this recognition is absurd because it is bad poetry with very little logistic value. And others have written about this disbelief that this for form could be considered as poetry at all. The term Insta poetry uh, is in fact often used as a derogatory term to deny it its status as poetry. This use of the term reflects a critique of their lack of literary quality, but also um, often of social media uh, more generally which are said to have a deleterious effect on our attention spans and cognitive abilities, and which would make us stupid. This debate has been particularly heated um, at the time of Donald Trump's election in 2016, Trump being a big user of Twitter uh, to communicate with his electors. So it's around the same period that Insta poetry gained momentum. Part of the problem with Insta poetry, it is felt, is that anyone can publish anything on social media. As a result, um, amateur writers without any formal training can post a text online and call it poetry. This means that these writers are, by, are bypassing cultural gatekeepers who are responsible for making sure that the work complies with certain literary standards, such as publishers and editors. The irony, of course, 
is that because publishing houses are at heart commercial endeavors, they are attracted by Ista poetry's potential to generate money. In a cultural context where possibilities for making a living through writing by using solely traditional channels are shrinking, and where support from governments for the cultivation of the traditional literary sphere is um, waning. The popularity of Insta poetry testifies to a, lot of, to a loss of the privileged position of trained writers and publishers, and the loss of the privileged position of literature at the center of culture. As demonstrated by Jim Collins in Bring, Bring on the Books for Everybody, in the last decades, literary publishing has been significantly affected by the rise of digital culture. Publishers had to adapt to an increasingly visual media ecology, where the status of literary work no longer depends on words alone, but evolves in a more complex environment of words and images. The example of Insta poetry is particularly revealing in that regard, since Instagram is an app primarily created for sharing images. On the app, uh, the poem is presented as an image which contains text. In Core's work, this pictorial aspect is visible in the juxtaposition of illustration and text. This constraint uh, can also lead to various experimentations. And we also find poetry, for instance, can be qualified as visual poetry or collage. And here's one example of um, such poetry by a Russian Instagram user from Latvia called uh, Misha Selifanov. The size of the image as shown on the app uh, affects how the poem is presented for the, for the text to remain legible, bringing a certain constraint in terms of its length. Many Ista poems are very brief and surrounded by plenty of blank space, which allows for an instant perception of the, the poem as a whole. In that sense, Insta poetry resembles the haiku, which for Roland Barthes is the paradigmatic short form. And the haiku has already been mentioned in several presentations of this group as a form particularly well suited to digital media because of its brevity. For Bart, uh, the haiku fascinates because its brevity allows for a very spaced visual presentation. And notice how Core's poems are easily recognizable through the abundance of white space that surrounds the text. The combination of text uh, and surrounding blank space work together to attract the reader's eye to the brevity of the form, which we find um, particularly appealing, writes Bart because it bears less risk of boring us than a longer form. In other words, when flipping through a book or um, a magazine, or when browsing on the web, brevity encourages the picking of a text. And this is, uh, it seems to me, especially true on Instagram, which is an app that requires scrolling, meaning that an image will be rapidly replaced by another and where the text as image would appear among other pictures that do not need to be read. Um, and therefore, um, those poems do need us to pause. Instagram does not only allow the sharing of images, but of videos as well. And this function is sometimes used by Insta poets. Um, I'm going to show you. I, can. I think you should open the link on your computer and then switch um, the screen. Yes. And share it. It's easy to navigate, yeah. Once again, I am tired of feeling tired. Sleepwalking man. And while I promise I am still in love with being alive, I cannot lie. 
I miss feeling like I am. Yeah, sorry, you only got the, the end of the poem. But you got the idea, I think. So that the author is reading his own poem on Instagram. Um, it's not easy to, yeah, okay. Um, So the, the text is, only, is not only seen, but also heard as it is read by its author, uh, which elicits a different mode of perception close to a public reading, or uh, in the case of Holly McNish, um, a slam performance. And we have uh, an example here from her Instagram feed. Um, McNish also uses this function um, on Instagram to post videos where she reads aloud both from her own poetry or by uh, poetry from other contemporary or canonical writers. Instagram and other digital media um, offer new platforms for, for or platforms for, for keeping the traditional practice of the reading aloud of poetry alive. So I was telling you at the beginning uh, of this presentation that a lot of Instapoets are uh, women. This gendered aspect has an influence on Easter poetry as a genre. To go back to Holly McNish, uh, her collection of um, that mixes poetry and prose called Nobody Told Me was awarded the prestigious Ted Hughes Award for new poetry. It was praised by the, judge, by the judges for reaching out to new poetry readers with her accessible style, but also for tackling social issues and especially gendered issues. Nobody Told Me focuses on her pregnancy and her experience as a mother. And this choice of subject matter is in line with the recurrent themes in Insta poetry, which frequently deals with topics such as body image, womanhood, self-expression, mental illness, and relationships, and female sexuality. One of the main reasons why uh, readers find coarse poetry so appealing is that it deals with very personal matters. It is centered around her survival as a victim of rape, her romantic relationships, and her experience as an immigrant. Because this personal aspect of Insta poetry is part of its appeal, Insta poetry often relies on a strong relationship between the first person lyric and the poet as a flesh and blood being. And this goes hand in hand with the creation of an image, a ethos for the poet online. On Instagram, poems often appear in, in alternance with flattering, well, with flattering selfies. These are examples from Instagram feeds. To give you another example, um, Amanda Lovelace's poetry is centered around body image and femininity. And this is one of the poems that is posted on her Instagram. But um, a descriptive word, it has no deeper meaning. It should not determine the worth or lack thereof of a human being. What I know now that I wish I knew then. Her Instagram feed uh, and work also channels an esoteric aesthetic centered around the figure of the witch, which has recently come back in vogue as an emblem of feminine power. The recurrent association, um, this recurrent association rests on the idea that women's bodies are closely connected to nature, among other things because of the parallels between menstrual cycles and the cycles of the moon. And by the way, periods are a recurrent theme in Insta poetry as well. It is also a reference to the practice of witch hunting uh, as a misogynous practice that was used to intimidate powerful women. In fact, many Insta poets who have reached wide audiences online are young women who assert their identity as women and criticize the patriarchy in their poetry and on their Instagram accounts. Insta poetry has also become a site for drawing attention to intersectionality, that is the combination of gender, class, race, 
sexual preference and age in the dynamics of oppression and especially in Insta poetry in English. And my impression is that um, this is much less present in um, Insta poetry in German, but I would love, yeah, I would have to look more into this. Or if you, if you know more into this, let me know. Rupi Kaur is again a good example of the presence of uh, intersectionality in Insta poetry, but there are other examples of young women of color who are successful Insta poets and who write about their, their experience. One of such poets is the English Yursa Daly Ward. She has published two books, uh, Bone and the Terrible with Penguin. Uh, recently, she, she co-wrote uh, with Beyonce the musical film uh, Black is King. And here is one of her poems, A Fine Art. You may have learned from your mother or any other hunted woman. Smiling at devils is a useful learned thing. Swallowing discomfort down in spades, holding it tight in your belly, aging on the inside only, keeping it forever sexy. In the books, um, her texts are much longer than on Instagram, again, and more akin to storytelling uh, in verse rather than to poetry. And um, here's another poem by um, a black poet, uh, K.Y. Robinson, Blood. I'm half jerk chicken and colored greens, suffocating in this nightmare called the American dream. Um, jerk chicken is a, is a traditional Caribbean dish, uh, especially from Jamaica, and colored greens um, is a typical Texan dish, which is actually originally African, but which is now typically considered as Texan. Yupili Chizala is also a black Insta poet. Chizala is from Malawi and she resides in the US. She uh, has published three collections of poetry, Soft Magic, Nectar, and The Fire Like You. And um, here is one of her poems. Here you are, black and woman, and in love with yourself. You are terrifying. They are terrified, and they should be. Gisela is published by Andrews McNeil, the publishing house that also works with uh, Rupi Kaur. And when asked about the appeal of Insta poetry, the president and publisher of Andrews McNeil, Christy Melville, commented that the medium of poetry reflects our age, where short form communication is something people find easier to digest and or connect with. Melville not only points to the now generally accepted idea of brevity as well suited to our age, but also to the rapid emotional response triggered by Insta poetry, which depends on the text accessible style. Many women, for the majority of Insta poetry's readership is female, do indeed express their interest in the poems, not so much for their stylistic qualities, um, although praises on the poet's skill do crop up, Rather, they find Insta poetry appealing because of its relatability. The poems the readers, the readers feel reflect the difficulties they face in their own daily lives and carry an emotional resonance. Insta poetry, I think, would be a, a good case study to address the interaction between emotions, social media, and literary forms. Both in English and in German, the genre is repeatedly praised and marketed for its appeal to emotions. For instance, the back cover of Keine Ahnung was für immer ist, Julia Engelmann's poetry collection. Um, uh, the back cover describes her poetry as poetry that touches the heart. And Engelmann is said to write with feeling. In addition, Engelmann's poetry is said to spark joy of living and bolster courage. Both in German and in English, a significant number of the poems function as slogans of encouragement and look like inspirational poetry, self-care, 
and personal development, all of which are labels that are sometimes used for insta-poetry. And we find this tendency both, um, both in English and in German. I'm not going to read this one because I don't want you to laugh at my accent. But um, yeah, I'll let you read. Or should I try? Betrachte mich wie ein, eine Pflanze, pflege mich, sei gut zu mir, such mir den geeigneten Platz, damit ich blühen kann. The simplicity of most Insta poetry, which clearly contributes to its popularity, is opposed to the traditional idea of a poem as difficult, sometimes ambiguous, formally constrained text. Insta poetry is at odds with the difficulty associated with how broad genres sees modernism, modernism, to which poetry is said to belong. In addition, the financial value it generates through its popularity on a platform such as Instagram also stands in opposition to the illusion of a neat separation between arts and money making. And Rupi Kaur tellingly describes herself as a poet entrepreneur. The genre aspires either praise for its authenticity and notability or disgust for its easy appeal to emotions, to formulas and cliches. The dynamics at work at work in the di discourses on Insta poetry that purport to establish its cultural illegitimacy are in many ways similar to the criticism received by other mass consumed genres and by romance novels in particular, which are also often disparaged for being poorly written and overly sentimental. The reasons why Insta poetry is attributed value by its readers is similar similar to the one provided by romance novel readers. Just as for romance novels, Insta poetry is valued, it seems to me, because of the motivational messages and the strong sense of self-worth it conveys. However, while romance novels often perpetuate representations of fulfillment for women through a, a heterosexual romantic relationship, Insta poetry allows women to speak in their own voice and talk about subjects that are that are important to them or to many of them. Insta poetry can be viewed as a manifestation of fourth wave feminism because it contributes to the call out culture, meaning that it helps to denounce sexism and misogyny through online channels. And think of the Me Too movement as an example of that, another example of that. And also insofar as it creates a global community of feminists through writing and reading of poetry. However, to what extent Insta poetry truly contributes to feminism, rather than simply repeats obvious statements in the name of audience response and growth remains to be established. And I will stop here. Yeah, <clears throat> right. Well, thank you very much for your uh, in-depth and um, um, fairly objective uh, presentation on Insta poetry. I think um, there was a lot and there is a lot which we uh, could learn from it. Um, I'm quite sure there might be questions. And uh, if you'd like to ask a question, you just um, send a message uh, into the chat and I'll take care of it. And then you go ahead. Or raise your hand. Oh, raise your hand, but I can't see everybody. So it's going to be difficult. Okay, well, we have somebody who's raising his hand. David Hawk. Hi, um, thank you so much, Ella. Um, that, was, that was fascinating. I love bad art and I found that really fascinating. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask you a few things. Um, oh, first of all, this is just in passing, but um, I'm, I'm American, um, as you can maybe tell from my accent, my mom's from the South and uh, collard greens are I, not really from Texas. I think they're more from like the deep South, um, but it's just, yeah, they're like a really, it's classic condiment for soul food. Um, but you know that, I guess, but um, 
but anyway, I wanted to ask about sort of the elephant in the room, I think, which is sex in all of this. Um, because, you know, Instagram, I mean, you said it, it, that it's as a platform, it mostly, uh, it, it mostly is used for images, but um, because it's the internet, you know, um, the only way to monetize that or to really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's mostly it sells sex. Um, and I mean, there's a huge industry of the Insta model, the Instagram model, which I'm sure you're familiar with. It's kind of, I mean, this is, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young women um, who, you know, use it as a platform to be sort of the, uh, I would say the burlesque, the equivalent of the burlesque performer of the contemporary era, um, you know, of the sort of self-employed precariat. Um, <laughs> and so, um, and, 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 you know, uh, so, and, and I noticed too, just looking at the poets, uh, that all of them, men and women are extremely good looking. And, and I mean, you, you, you featured all of the, you know, the, the selfies next to the poems. Um, so I'm not saying this to be glib or to criticize it. Um, it's just that it's such an embedded feature of the platform, not, not just the internet, but specifically Instagram, um, that I wonder, I think you have to approach it um, as part of this aesthetic or cultural phenomenon, and I wonder how you would. It's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think, you know, despite the bad quality of the poetry, Baudelaire, for instance, might be thrilled that, like, internet burlesque performers are, you know, juxtaposing themselves to their poems and, doing, you know, but, um, but uh, it's, 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 it's interesting, and, and especially with your expertise on ephemerality and, um, uh, and, and sort of um, our, our, res our, our reception um, of these things, I wonder how sex plays into that. Sorry for the long question, thank you. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, first, first of all, I, I just want to, as you're American, <laughs> I want to ask you, um, Color greens, you said, is um, from the south. So Texas is part of it, right? So it's not specific to, to Texas, but it's from the south. Of it's yeah, it's more deep south. And actually, the reason that it's more deep south than Texas, I mean, you can find color greens in Texas, but um, you know, Texas came pretty late um, to uh, slavery um, because it was uh, it was sort of colonized or became a state much later. Um, I mean, it was a slave state, but um, you know, if the roots of, Afri of sort of African-American slavery and diaspora um, that gave rise to soul food are in the deep south, and that's where colored greens come from. So, you know, you're thinking like Alabama, Mississippi, um, Georgia, um, okay. that region. Yeah, yeah because, because she's from Texas, so that's oh, why I yeah. associate that with Texas more than just yeah. like, because, yeah, I've had cold greens even in New York. I mean, it's just oh, like yeah. an American dish right now. So They're everywhere. And in fact, most jerk places in the United States, I don't, you, you don't really find collard greens in Jamaica so much, but in the United States, a lot of jerk places sell collard greens with the jerk chicken. So like in New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. So sorry for this um, uh, digression. Okay. Um, about the good looking uh, Insta poets. Yeah, it's definitely um, a feature of Insta poetry, and yeah, as as I was saying, it's it's a, a way of also of um, creating an ethos or an image um, in addition to to the poetry. But you also have um, that for um, traditional authors, and especially um, of romance novels, where you have testimonies of readers, female readers, imagining the author as being good looking. Uh, or as being uh, charming, or um, but in the case of Insta poetry, you def you definitely have um, that link where uh, Instagram is made to create it, it facilitates that creation of an image and especially of an attractive. Well, you would like to look attractive on Instagram for sure. So yeah, and then in relation to sex specifically. Um, a lot of the, the poems that are posted are um, also about the female sexuality. So if... <sighs> Which is why that, that question mark at the end, feminist question mark, I think is a very big, significant question mark. <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah. But it's, it's something that I'll, yeah, I'll have to address more in depth. Yeah, for sure. 
in the future. But yeah, there's that link. But also some 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 instapos actually play on that, like Amanda Lovelace, who is not like um, um, right. who would not be considered as beautiful in the right in and style I, terms. Yeah, and I would call that in a, a, kind of an exception that that proves the norm or proves the rule, especially since then she gravitates towards more subcultural kind of audience with things like witchcraft and Wicca and you know but yeah geeks and nerds yeah, yeah. geeks and nerds yeah <laughs> yeah definitely yeah thank you thank you for that remark okay the next on my list would be Nicolas Emer okay thank you so much for your instructive lecture uh, I have a question concerning the um, relationship and the interactions between the publishers of poetry and the readers um, as, as far as I know from Twitter, um, the readers sometimes react with their own poems. Uh, do you have there some uh, experience on that? Uh, do you mean whether Insta Poetry encourages people to write po poetry on social media? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think it definitely helps because since um, it is not, it's it's more accessible than before. It definitely uh, encourages people to post uh, Insta poetry online. And, and then you have uh, problems with plagiarism, of course. So people just kind of imitate um, other people's poetry. And then because everything is, or well, a lot of the poetry is based on cliches and uh, formulas, it's difficult to say which one is the original and which, was, which one is not. But I think it's also, one of the effects of Insta poetry is that it um, it makes people think that everyone, or at least if you want to post something and you have that wish to write, you can. And yeah, that's one of the effects, I think, of that phenomenon. Definitely, yeah. Okay, Josephine von Zetsewitz, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. And um, I'm also working on something that is maybe a bit similar, not Insta poetry, but um, Russian poetry that is published on the internet. And one of the questions I'm, I'm speaking at six o'clock, and one of the questions that I am kind of asking myself and asking everybody else, so I'm basically just um, taking a straw poll here, um, is does the is the book does the book um remain the gold standard and um i am at the moment in norway and i remember last year when i arrived and i didn't know any norwegian or anything and i picked up a book by ruby core um just you know to have something to read on the bus and i don't use instagram so i have no idea she wasn't i mean i now know but um because I looked her up, but I had no idea she was an Instagram celebrity, and it seemed a really nicely made book, hardcover, and you know, milk and honey, so it all fits together. The poems are actually a beautiful sequence. And I was wondering, does the book, I mean, the jump from Instagram to a book with illustrations, wow, that a hardcover, that's a, a big thing. So, you know, I wonder whether you have any observations on the interplay of these two factors. Thank you. Yeah, actually the same happened to me. I went to a bookstore and then I picked up a book by Ruby Cora and I had no idea. <laughs> She's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, so I would say that um, the book remains um, the standard for the standard even for authors and because as i was saying the the insta posts often self-published so for them publishing a book even if it's self-published it's still a book and so it's it's a way to um to put out their work um in a more serious format let's say it like that and then uh being published by a publisher it's definitely like the step the next step for them, but it's it's definitely something they're looking for. I would say uh, it remains um, it remains uh, a mark of cultural legitimacy, even if yes. 
Yeah, even Absolute if legitimacy is a good term. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Well, if I, if I may add something, just, just a footnote. Um, she tried to get uh, the book published by regular publishing houses and she couldn't find a publisher. So then she ventured into self-publishing and that proved to be very successful um, because um, she could um, keep a huge part of the sales profits for herself. Um, this is how it developed. And I think Instagram was a kind of detour, but she mainly understood herself and she understands herself as a poet, a published poet. Yeah, that's why Insta poetry is a derogatory term, actually, for because there are still poets, but the word Insta poetry so closely associates where they published or, or where they are famous or visible with their poetry, but it, for them, it remains poetry, whether it's on Instagram or in book format. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now it's, yeah, yeah. it's Yasmin Boom is next on the list. So yes. first of all, uh, thanks a lot. That was a very inspiring talk and um, it triggered me to uh, go and look up the authors of the last volume of poetry I read because it was stylistically very similar. Uh, so far, I have not been able to um, ascertain whether the authors are some sort of insta poets or not, but I suspect they were at least influenced by it. Um, so what I wanted to ask is, um, do you have any studies or preliminary findings about the formal elements? Because it seems to me that there is a certain tendency for, let's say, uh, formal quirks in these poems. Like you, you mentioned the very short lines. Um, there often seems to be some sort of twist on a word with different meanings in different contexts or um, the accentuation of words, almost as if uh, the poet wants to evoke the idea of being, um, well, spoken to in a very uh, specific kind of voice. So um, I wonder if there's any scholarship on the formal elements of this. Hmm, that's a good question. Well, I couldn't find much. Um, no, actually I couldn't find much. I looked for um, studies. There is actually one book that came out really recently uh, and it's called um, Poetry Unbound. Um, I'm going to write it in the chat. By Chaser and published by Columbia University Press, um, in which uh, he has a chapter on, um, which is not about Insta poetry, it's more uh, about the relationship between media and poetry and how it circulates um, in these different media and yeah, what, what it entails. Um, and in the last chapter, he has um, yeah, a few remarks on the formal um, qualities of Insta poetry. Um, but they're the same ones I already mentioned in my talk. So, but maybe you'll find something else. I don't know, maybe I'm looking for something else and you'll like, you find something in there. Um, apart from that, and I also think that uh, each Insta poet has a little bit of her or his style. So it's, it's you cannot like completely generalize um, the formal features, the, the remarks about the formal features of Insta poetry. And I would be really careful not to generalize actually, um, because um, as I was saying, the, there's a lot of different kinds of poetry published on Instagram. And I don't think we, we as scholars um, know yet what, what is um, all of like all of what is out there. Oh, there is somebody saying that there is a lot on um, German Wikipedia on Insta poetry. Interesting. I hope I have answered your question. Okay. 
Oh, thank you. I will be worried now because, Anna, did you have an urgent question relating to something which was just mentioned right now? Um, so I, I'd have to ask the others for patience because you, you skipped the line, you skipped the queue, and you, you, you go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the previous uh, discussion. I don't know if it's uh, relevant now, but um, I just go ahead and tell that um, the right. So the Insta uh, poets. So like I, I um, have an active Instagram and I uh, follow some, and like um, every day some uh, unknown um, Instagram poets who uh, don't have any published books and I don't think they intend to publish anything, um, just adding. And um, I think that what like their intention is this, um, that some um, Instagram um, influencer, like with millions of followers, will repost in their stories, their poem, so that they uh, have more followers. And um, so I think that's, that's their point. So um, it's, it's not that you go to the uh, book uh, shop and uh, buy a volume of poetry, but um, they, um, I think they, they, they just want to be popular. So it's like the, 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 the other way around. To make money. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. And uh, well, sorry, she young, but... Uh... It's your turn now. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. It's really interesting. I'm currently also working on contemporary Chinese classical style internet poetry, classicist poetry in my term. And for me, the difference in media form and the results in the in the kind of poetry, they tend to, uh, they tend, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say create, but they tend to make visible a very different because I see, and I, what really strikes me is that those poets, those Insta poets, tend to post an image of their written poems, or even a, a, an image of the printout page. That means the textual boundaries are fixed. Even the textual form is fixed, not allowing any kind of interaction between them and their readers, right? So that is very different from uh, Chinese poetry publishing media. Instagram is is banned in China as well as as well as most of the as Twitter as most of the Western services. Instead, for Chinese internet poets in the the first decade of the twenty first century, the most they primarily used the BBS, so it is a forum, and the relation between the author and the reader is quite was it quite egalitarian. That means the author posts a poem, the reader comments. Quite often, you see kind of to and fro, resulting in many revised versions of the poem. It changed in the Twitter era because in Twitter you have public accounts, you publish the poem, but the readers can still comment and maybe the poet later would publish a new version but the, this kind of interaction has been significantly reduced and i wonder just how in which way the in, on the instagram the this kind of interaction between the author and his poets are still allowed to happen or is it the Otherwise, if, this, if the boundary of the text is fixed, it's more like the traditional form of publishing, right, in a certain sense. That's my question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, you still have that um, um, possibility to comment and say whether you like their work or not in the comments. Uh, on Instagram, but it's true that this this um, interaction is much more limited, as you said, on um, forums. Um, it would be actually interesting to compare perhaps fan fiction forums with uh, Insta poetry. Like I don't know, like from what you're saying, I think it's that that could be a good. Um, um, avenue of research as well um and yes it's very very striking that uh poetry the poems on instagram 
Well, one of the things I found difficult is that sometimes I was looking for a specific poem, but I couldn't find it because uh, I, you, you cannot search for, for text on Instagram because every poem is actually an image. So yes, there is that limitation in terms of interaction. Um, then of course you can look on Google, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that well. Sorry, you wanted to say something. Yeah, and I also think that because what is posted is an image, it encourages kind of more aestheticized the presentation of the film, of the poem, right? Yeah. Just not just the, the message of the text per se, but how you present it, what your handwriting, and also the, the mechanism of interaction has been predetermined by the platform. On Instagram, I guess the most common would be like or not. So you, you accumulate likes, you don't accumulate criticism. So I just, I find it's really, it would be really interesting to compare all these different technological platforms and see how they enable different kinds of poetry as well as the mechanism of interaction. Yeah. And I also think that really contributes to the image uh, of the author um, as, as someone who has a visual um, aesthetic mm -hmm. um, and also contributes to the creation of that personal style through the handwriting. Some of the uh, instances yeah. actually just publish uh, poetry written in their hand. So yeah, there's that definitely that link. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I think the created or authorial persona would also contribute to the interpretation of the poetry. Okay, I'm taking up too much time. <laughs> thank you. So uh, next one is uh, Lucia Pupo from Buenos Aires. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, uh, Dr. Mingasova. I found it very interesting. And I would like to start with a confession. I find myself like Umberto Eco in the mid 60s when he wrote Apocalyptics versus uh, Integrated Scholars. Because um, uh, these examples of Insta poetry and, and my students are, are fans of Rupi Kaur and so on, um, make me think or, or re-question what we consider to be the poetry institution. Because on one side, uh, as we all know, there is the poetic function of language, as uh, Jacobson in his famous essay of the 50s uh, mentioned, that it can be in a slogan, like uh, I like Ike, you know, a political slogan. Whereas the poem as a construction uh, has an aesthetic uh, value that we critics are the ones to, and I wouldn't say establish, but to question, to study, to analyze. And um, uh, the, the, the institution, I take the term from Dubois and, and the new rhetorics, uh, also is related to this, the literature system, as in Bourdieu's notion of Ocham. And so it has a relation to tradition. When we speak of short forms, of course, you mentioned the haiku, we have the aphorism, the calligram, uh, objective poetry. And uh, uh, what I suspect from these authors is that they really haven't read any poetry before. They just express their feelings. And so when we talk of uh, cliches, um, the language of social media, marketing, a lot of self-help literature, because uh, I wonder if that is really feminism or, uh, of course, young people expressing themselves in a sort of jargon that reminds of feminism, uh, an intersectional feminism in concrete. But um, uh, I, I think I, may, I find myself a bit old <laughs> when my students come with this because uh, uh, I think that the, the, to be a poet, you start by reading poetry, by, by getting to know the tradition of your own language. And, and these people, of course, are amateurs. Uh, it is very interesting as a phenomenon, uh, but uh, 
I really wonder if we should devote ourselves to, uh, to consider the aesthetic value because it's a question of getting likes, being popular, expressing themselves. Uh, I have a student who is working with Rupi Kaur and we have decided <laughs> that it is best to focus on the reader response approach. What readers find in it, but uh, I, I said we cannot treat Rupi Kaur like Mallarmé. I mean, uh, I think we scholars uh, some, at some point have to draw a line that we, maybe this is not poetry in the, in the traditional sense, that, that I, I don't mean to, uh, to be judgmental in this, but they are different things. What, what do you think? Maybe I'm a bit old and, and not so open to this phenomena, but I find them uh, a poor quality. Now to you. A lot of them, yeah, are definitely of very poor quality. Um, and this is what I find so fascinating. Why do people, yeah, why do people love them so much? Um, and it's actually one of my, one of the things I wanted to do uh, in the future is really um, consider that aesthetic experience um, or rather uh, address them uh, in relation to the aesthetic experience that they could afford perhaps or could not afford at all. And this is one of the questions that I'm asking myself as well, especially um, since I'm working on slowness. Um, of course, the aesthetic quality of a work of art, uh, like Shklovsky said, uh, defamiliarization, the, make, the, the, the fact that work of art flows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, um, this is not really the case in that poetry but then if yes to what extent and this is one of the questions that i'm asking myself as well um and also they're not exactly um written to that effect um since they they're, they're published on a platform that is um uh all about scrolling they are not really written to that effect. They're written to have a rapid uh, response, emotional response. Yeah. And you see the comparison very well when you compare, um, the, the difference very well when you compare um, Insta poetry published on Instagram and then uh, poetry published in a book. They, the, the, the poems are usually much longer in a book. Um, so yeah, there is that, uh, they do not exactly have the same aim, I, I feel. Even like even with Rupi Kaur's poetry, when you see it on Instagram and when you see it in a book, and that blank space uh, in both cases, it does not produce the same effect, I feel. In the book, it, it makes you uh, want to stop more than in, in, on Instagram. Uh, where it also functions as a way to so, slow you down, but in, in the book, I think it's more, um, it's more effective even. And so there is that question of media uh, and then also of aesthetic experience and then of rhythm, which I find very interesting. And yeah, this is one of the questions I ask, yeah, I'm asking myself as well, so thank you. Just a little thing. Um, I totally agree with you when you mentioned that, that these instant poets uh, get, uh, aim to get a, a rapid response. And on the other side, when you started speaking of uh, in your lecture, I, I think I remember you mentioned how poetry um, demands slowness or a certain pause. No? Jeanette calls it a threshold of silence before you enter a poetic text. And it, it seems like the antagonistic effect of this poetry that is consumed and passed away, just the opposite of, of a traditional poem or verse that has a resonance, which is also a, a very uh, important term to define poetry as we know it. Uh, but uh, thank you, and, and let's continue thinking of, of these questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, officially the last question by 
Georg Offelmann, who's been very patient. Thank you very much, Ella, for a very intriguing talk. Um, I would uh, like to ask a question, which is a kind of follow up to David's argument of the co-presence of the profile picture of attractive young women and occasional poetry. Um, three years ago, I became interested in the Facebook strategies of elderly poets and um, their self-presentation on Facebook. And I came to the conclusion that there is an imperative of metonymic self-representation, which forbids synecdochic self-pictures. There can only be the automatic um, profile picture as co-present with a poem or a picture of a book or a bookshelf or whatever it is. Um, and now in your intriguing material, we have a different situation. And I'm wondering whether this is due to the difference in the platform, the more visual medium of Instagram, whether it's about generation or whether my um, rather naive binary of intellectual poets on the one hand and self-workers on the other hand who would post footies, so synecdochic self-pictures, is not working anymore. Um, because here we have uh, poetry not as the main message, um, as Anna put it, um, for the sake of self-promotion. So um, there is a different um, teleology um, in this self-presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you had to, uh, any thoughts about this. Well, I think the, the question of age was very important. Uh, as you were saying, there were elderly poets. Uh, yes, mine is 70. The one whom I studied is 70. 70, okay. Um, there's, was it, uh, I have a question for you then, was it a, really a wish of the poet not to present himself on, on was it on Facebook? On Facebook, you said, right? It's on Facebook, yes. Yeah. And Wait. this is a very active blogger, um, and he uses uh, multimodal um, approaches in his blogging, um, at least not films, but uh, many pictures. And he would um, depict himself only with his cat, never himself alone. Mm -hmm. So this is what I call the metonymic device there. I think, I think you could say that Facebook is more metonymic as a platform and Instagram is more synecdochic. Um, I, Ella, I don't know if you'd agree. Hmm. That's my guess, but... I think it's because of the platform. Um, well, first, Facebook is not uh, an app exactly made to share only images. So that's a big difference, I think. It's in the way they made and what they made to share. Um, but the question of age, I, I think, I think there, there is a big difference in, um, I think, isn't it also because the poet himself didn't want to, I don't know, like, I, I haven't, I don't know that poet, so I'm, I'm not, I'm just guessing. But isn't that a question of um, how he himself viewed, viewed himself and how, yeah, he didn't want he to actually wants to sell his poetry offline in the form of a book. So Facebook is an instrument for selling online paper copies. And maybe with your candidates, it's a different situation. Uh, yeah, I, there are also Insta poets who do not post photos of themselves. Um, so I wouldn't say it's, it's really just a question of being published or not. But I think it's a question also of um, of, yeah, of the image you want to convey to your readers of yourself. Uh, some, some authors do not want to be seen and some others thrive on being seen. So it's, it works for any author, of, um, an author of fiction or some people want to remain um, anonymous, like Elena Ferrante, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure, there's a question of platform, of course, but also, like in general, I wouldn't make um, 
very harsh generalizations <laughs> about poetry posted on social media or in book format or I think we should be careful with those generalization in general, but that's my opinion. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> no more questions? Contribution? Oh yes, more questions, two more questions. Klaus Telge and Anna Fies. Klaus, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very rich talk. I was just wondering, maybe you already mentioned this, but if there's like one indisposable form of feature, it seems to be enchantment, isn't it? I mean, this is also like how all the mockery works. And in that sense, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, insta, -poesy, insta poetry is opposed to like this idea of um, poetry being difficult, it rather draws from that. And I think that the key here or the key form of feature seems to be enchantment. Well, that, that's all. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, sometimes it's completely, well, in the readers, or in my view, completely arbitrary on job mode, which does not mm -hmm. make sometimes much sense in terms of rhythm and, um, but yeah, that's, that's a big, um, you're right, that's a one formal feature that, but it's, it's still not, it's not general. Mm -hmm. like, not all but them. maybe then the other would be like intimacy, but I think this also uh, has been mentioned, you know, the intimacy between uh, the online writer and the reader. So maybe that mm -hmm. would be another like a form of feature, yeah. I'd say. But definitely on Jean-Mo, like, yeah, there are parodies which, which say that mm -hmm. uh, anybody can be a poet now if they have a, um, how do you call that, um, um, the enter key. Um, if they can push the enter button, you know, and then just write something and push enter every three or four words. So there, there is mockery about that as well, about enjambement. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was also wondering if you maybe could relate this to like, like more traditional for, forms, like, uh, like in German, you would say Gelegenheitsdichtung, like occasional verse or something like that, like other short forms. Could you, could you tell me more about that? Because I'm not at all a specialist of German literature. <laughs> So it's occasional, uh, yeah, I understand German, but... Or occasional poetry. What kind of occasion <laughs> would it be for? It can be any kind of occasion, like okay, an everyday so occasion, you know, everyday feelings whatsoever. Okay, so you mean more... Because there's a very long tradition to that, I think. Okay, interesting. So more of a popular... Hmm. Is it more popular form then? Like everyone can like write occasional verse or occasional poetry. It yeah, okay. also could be like a rather like decremat, uh, um, yeah, well, yeah, that's okay, it yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. To keep it short, yeah. Okay, interesting, yeah. I guess we could. <laughs> mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Anna Fies, please. Actually, I wanted to add something to the previous discussion uh, with uh, Dirk Uffeldmann and his elderly poet, who is uh, also on Instagram, <laughs> but not so active. Uh, so he, po he doesn't post any poems, but himself and his wife. <laughs> and um, yeah, what th th there is kind of tendency with this poet, like for example, uh, there is also one uh, poet who might follow like, um, Boris Humaniuk, uh, who was active on Facebook, but on Instagram, he posts his paintings and um, it's um, nothing um, to do with uh, poetry. So um, also Ia Kiva, who uh, posts her um, poems on Facebook, but on Instagram, she posts some kind of um, urban images uh, which she takes um, when she uh, just traveling or, um, or, or selfies. So um, it's more private, but um, also um, I think that they, um, they also like wh wh when they have a lot of followers and uh, have some likes. 
Yeah, definitely. There, there's, for instance, one of the authors I worked on, Teju Cole, who's a Nigerian American. He also um, experimented with different platforms to publish different things uh, because he's also a photographer. So he would publish his photography on Instagram and his writing uh, or, yeah, just use Twitter and other things, um, again, on Facebook. So, yeah, there's that um, uh, interaction between the different media where the author kind of creates uh, his world or her world on different platforms. Maybe these interact or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all questions asked and well, thank you very much, Ella Mingasova. This was a very inspiring uh, presentation you gave and we had a very animated discussion. And it's only a brief goodbye um, quoting Dame Viralin, we'll meet again after the coffee break uh, for Josephine von Sitzewitz's lecture. Thank you. Thank you.